Our Estuary, sponsored by the Humber Nature Partnership and BP Chemicals. bird migration spectacle. I'm here to meet Nathan Pickering, one of the volunteers at the Bird Observatory here at Spurn. So Nathan, you've been a volunteer here for over 15 years. This is quite a unique place. What is it that's special to you? For me, Spurn's special because of um, one appeal, visible migration. The birds that come through Spurn here some days can be unbelievable. 20,000 birds can come through here in a day um, and each time I visit here I'm, I'm always surprised at the scene there's a different number of birds coming through at any one time. So what sort of birds can we typically see here? Typically this time of year you should have swallows migrating south, swallows that are bred in places like Scotland, um, Scandinavia, Iceland, they're making a the journey back through, back through England and they filter through Spain on the way into um, southern Europe and northern Africa as well as birds like meadow pipits, meadow pipits that are bred in Iceland, Scandinavia, Scotland again, all, all filtering through, as well as waders, waders that are bred on the Arctic yeah. areas and travelling back south. Some of them are spending the winter on the Humber, but generally a lot of them will be migrating through onto wintering grounds into southern Europe. Is there anything that's been visiting that's quite you know, unique? And Luckily, there's a mask strike and that's uh, extremely rare, or the third British record. Is there any chance that we could go and yes, see? Yes, of course there is. Lead the way. So Nathan, can you tell me what's going on here? This is bird ringing. Um, the observatory's main process is to ring birds to monitor the migration. This is Paul, he's a warden. He explains to you what he's doing now. Right, this is a meadow pipit. These birds are passenger through sperm at the moment, in their thousands. We can get up over 20,000 in a day. What we do, we put an individually ringed number on the, on the spring, on the bird's leg, which if it gets caught again, or found dead, we can see where it's gone, how long it's lived, causes of death, population increase and decreases by the amount of adults and juveniles that we catch. It's a simple closed ring, so once I do this, is he fumbling about? Number 77, Tim, by the way. Yep. Right, that's closed now, and that was go up and down the leg and spin round and round. So, if this bird is found again, then we can see how long it's lived, where it's been. Then we just do a few biometrics, we do a simple wing measurement 80, and then we just weigh him. Oh. This is the quickest, easiest way to do it in a cone. Oh Upside down. 17.6 grams, that is. Which is about. Eight. It's a three. So, how old do you think he is? This is, this is about three months old. This is born this year, this bird. Oh. This bird is on its way to the to Mediterranean for the winter. It'll pass through Belgium, then down along the coast through France, and then down into the Mediterranean. If you look at these feathers here, see these are white ones? Yeah. These are different. This makes this a juvenile, this is what makes it born this year. Yeah. This was an adult bird, more than a year old, it, this, all this will be concolorous right across. Mm. So this is a youngster, so and now we just let him go. Okay. Ready? Never to be seen again. Aww. Thank you for meeting us Paul. It it's is a pleasure. Nice. Hopefully Nathan will be taking us to see this shrike from Turkey.
I'm here today with Paul Freer, who's a fisheries officer with the Environment Agency, and Paul's going to be talking to us about some of the most elusive and secretive creatures of the Humber, the lamprey. Welcome, Paul. Hello. Could you tell us a little bit about lampreys? Lamprey are a fascinating creature. They predate the dinosaurs. They're about 450 million years old. And we've got uh, three species in the UK. That's the brook lamprey, which is quite a small one, probably about uh, six inches long, 15 centimetres. Then we've got the river lamprey, which probably grows to about 30 centimetres a foot long. And then we've got the big brother of them all, which is the sea lamprey. And the, the river and the sea lamprey are the ones that come through the Humber estuary. Okay. The migratory forms that live out at sea. And you brought some with you today, I see. Which yes, are, we've got uh, some to look at. We can show you those. So, James, I've got some juvenile lamprey here. We've got some, these very tiny ones um, are from this year. They will have, their parents would have spawned in the spring of this year and they will have, they're just a summer old. And these slightly bigger ones, they're two summers old. So they grow quite slowly? Yeah, very slow indeed. And these, these lamprey, these are called larvae. They're amacete larvae. They're blind. Um, they've got no formed gill features at all like the adults. They live in burrows in the mud, feeding on organic silt and detritus. And they'll probably stay there for up to four years. Uh, they go through metamorphosis and they'll just turn into a miniature version of their adult form. They go lovely bright silver colour. They will feed at sea for probably 18 months, two years. And then they will repeat the journey, they will come all the way back up the Humber and then they will go to some nice, fresh, clean gravels to spawn on probably in the Swale and the Ewer system of the, of the Yorkshire Ooze. And they, they remind me of eels, but these are not related to eels in any way, are they? No, these are, um, I would say, very primitive form of life, um, the lamprey, and they, they don't have any bony structures. They're completely cartilaginous, so more like more the, like a shark. The, yeah, much more related to those. So the hagfish are a, a, a common ancestor, um, and it's and they haven't really changed the form in, in in 450 million years. So they must have got it right fairly quickly. Well, we obviously looked at the small ones now. Um, I gather you've got some bigger ones you can show us as well. Yes, we've got some adult river lamprey to show you. Are you, uh, are you feeling brave? Oh yes, they're fine-looking creatures. So these are the adult river lamprey that have swum up through the Humber. And you can see that they've completely changed from the, the larval forms we had in the tray earlier. Yeah, he's getting what a bit frisky, got. that one. So completely developed eyes, gills, and there's the magical sucker there. Okay. And if you're an unsuspecting cod in the Humber, and you come across a lamprey or a lamprey comes across you, He's going to fasten on to you. Right. This is one of the things that people don't particularly like about lampreys, that they will then rasp away. What is he? You can see his teeth. Like a little circular saw, and he's going to rasp away on the side of a cod and eat the flesh and, dare I say it, suck the juices. So he makes, actually makes a hole in the side of the fish. Yeah. And occasionally you will see fish with the little circular marks in the flesh. And are the, are the lampreys of the Humber thriving? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, the Humber now, you know, due to the work of the Environment Agency and its predecessors, it, it's, it's cleaner now than probably since the Industrial Revolution. There used to be very bad water quality conditions. As we've seen those water quality conditions improve, not only we've got the lamprey back, we've got the salmon back, we've got the sea trout back, and we're seeing some of the more rarer species such as the shad and the smelt. So yeah, the Humber's really doing well. I think these guys have probably been out of the water for long enough now. Do you think it's time to release them? Yeah, let's get them back in the Humber. Okay. Quite lively. They, they want to be on their migration route. <laughs> they want to be migrating. There you go, James. Okay. Are you going to put them in? I will. In you go, my friends. Well, this is the only third ever British record. The first one being in Fife in Scotland, 
second one being on the Isles of Scilly, and this is the third ever bird to see in the UK. <laughs> so it's a real coup for wow. bird, Sperm Bird Observatory it's to have this bird on their land. And then the word got out of it. Word got out of the social media network and yeah, what here we, we have are, here yeah. is what we have. What I have noticed though is, is there's, no, there's hardly any women. There's nearly all men, these, these twitches, is it? Well, twitches are, is a word I don't particularly <laughs> like to use, but oh, twitches right. are, the, are the ones. Um, I think it's just a man thing. Collecting <laughs> things, collecting numbers, collecting birds, collecting this, collecting that. But yeah, it do is a million. Do you get You do lots of women. Women are getting more into it through photography and they're just generally interested in wildlife, really. Yeah. It's a real wildlife. Bird watching isn't just about seeing rare birds or seeing scarce birds, it's about enjoying the wildlife, yeah. going out in the countryside, enjoying themselves. It's, it's, it's quite prominent because it's got such a white sort of chest or something. Isn't That's it? correct, yeah. It's also got a really nice long tail as well, mm. and a little peach buff, buffing it on the flanks on the side there. Fabulous. So it, lo it looks really pretty. But what, surely he won't stay here for forever? No, he won't stay here forever. He'll, he'll, he'll keep on migrating through. Um, whether he makes it to Turkey or not yeah. is another thing altogether. We don't know that. I'm here with Darren Woodhead, um, and he's painting the uh, shrike, um, several several copies of it. And this is just beautiful, absolutely stunning. How long have you been here, Darren? Um, came down this morning. Oh, so I came down from, this morning. Yeah, when, when I'm I'm here, I'm I'm here to paint. <laughs> <laughs> so I got here first thing this morning. Of, yeah. It was quite distant for a while, and now it's starting to come close, which is great. I mean, these birds are, in themselves are amazing, but shrikes in particular, because they, they tend to ladder. So I've just been watching it now, and it's, it's starting to ladder beetles. Oh, it's been lovely to meet you, Darren. Those, yeah, and you those too. are absolutely stunning, beautiful pictures. I'll leave you to it. <laughs> Thank you, you're welcome. Thank you. Our Estuary, sponsored by the Humber Nature Partnership and BP Chemicals. Our Estuary, sponsored by the Humber Nature Partnership and BP Chemicals. I'm here at the RSPB Blacktoff Sands Nature Reserve with Site Manager Pete Short. Hi Pete. Hi. Thank you very much for letting us come yeah, in here pleasure. and see your beautiful ponies. Could you explain a bit more about them? Yeah, our uh, conic ponies, they're uh, um, a Polish breed um, but they're very closely related to the last of the wild horses called the tarpons. Um, and they were brought over to be used in conservation um, because they, they, they've can manage the, the landscape very naturally um, and they create landscapes that are very difficult to, to mirror by machinery and, and the work that we would do ourselves. So um, we brought them here um, about three years ago. What, what, what is different from them to a normal pony? So your pet ponies um, are probably quite soft uh, in terms of how they could survive out in, in the wild. Um, these animals will survive down to minus 40 and they love the cold weather. Um, they're also very robust so that they actually um, eat different plants to manage their diet to actually control the, the, the problems that, that a, a domestic horse would have. Um, as long as you range, let them range over a big area, uh, they will look after themselves. Are there any plans to breed these ponies? Um, not at the moment. Uh, the idea was, was to bring um, just the male ponies to sight, um, partly to, to take away the, the, the problems that they have with, with, with lots of males within the herds in other places. But in future, if we can get more land, if we can manage more land with the conics, then yes, possibly. Well, this is a beautiful site that we have here. Whereabouts is it on the Humber? So we're actually just between the Ouse and the Tre River Trent um, at the confluence, literally where the Humber starts. So this is the, 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 the very start, the apex out at the, the, the end of the reserve 
uh, is is classified as the Humber. Can we go in or is it Yeah, yeah, a... jump in. Just as long as you're not scared of horses. Come on, boys. So, Pete, what's that mark down the back? Um, that's called the eel stripe. It's what a lot of primitive breeds have. It, 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 even cattle um, and, and, and certainly a lot of the horses and wild, wild horses um, all have that uh, distinctive mark. So have they got their own unique personalities? Oh yeah, most definitely. They're all very different, um, you know, um, depending on, on this one. He, he's friendly. He seems a tamer. He's that's a tamer. Yeah. Um, the two behind him you don't really touch. Right. Um, this one he'll let you let you touch him, but usually it's only with me and, and when I'm about. So yeah. it's, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend anybody else getting in with these uh, these beasts because they are really yeah. wild. Well, thanks very much, Pete, for seeing us and, and a privilege meeting your beautiful horses. They're absolutely gorgeous. Uh, so it's over to you, James. I'm here at the deep, Hull's famous aquarium on the banks of the Humber. This is a project that's all about conservation rather than profit. But it's not just exotic species that they're interested in here. So I'm going to go inside and meet the curator, Katie Duke, to find out a little bit more about what's living out there and what's living in there. I'm very privileged to have been allowed behind the scenes at the deep and so here I am with Katie. Hello Katie. Good morning. Thanks for having us. No problem at all. We're obviously on the banks of the Humber, very yeah. close to the estuary here. You've obviously got a lot of uh, exotic fish in the aquarium, but can you tell us a little bit, little bit about what lives in the river? Yeah, well the, the Humber estuary itself is just a fantastic myriad of life. Um, there have been recorded, I believe, about 83 species of fish really? in there, which is, which is pretty impressive. Um, so yes, I think regularly we would get fishermen on there fishing for species such as flounder and uh, pollock and um, whiting and so on. Obviously it's very seasonal, uh, you do get cod coming up the estuary as well, so, so yeah. really yes, there's, there's, there's an awful lot of life out there. And is there anything living there that shouldn't be there? Well, there are a few things. Yes, unfortunately, the, uh, the Chinese mitten crab is considered an invasive species. Um, it first arrived on the Thames back in the 1930s and um, has since sort of spread up the coast. And the, and the Chinese mitten crab loves the estuary sort of situation. It likes the, 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 the sort of cross between fresh and salt water. So it comes into the salt water to, to breed and lay eggs and then travels up uh, the rivers to, to molt where it, it finds it easier to, to sort of cast its shell. And does it have mittens? It does actually have mittens. It has sort of furry, furry um, mittens, so it's unlike any of our native crabs. Um, and so yes, this invasive species has, has pretty much uh, spread across the country now. And we are on the lookout for other species as well. The Yorkshire Wildlife Trust regularly puts um, sample plates down where they're looking for things such as the slipper limpet, which is also unfortunately travelling up the coast too. It's been found in Lincolnshire, but not quite yet in the Humber or, or further north. Okay. And could you tell us a little bit about any special projects that are going on at the deep at the moment? Well, we've got quite a few things going on. Um, a lot of our projects uh, focus in different areas. So we have um, our manta ray project, which is based in uh, off the Sudanese coast in the Red Sea. That's looking at uh, pristine populations of manta and actually genetically studying them to work out um, if they're hybridizing, which uh, we, we've had some fantastic data back to say that they are. But there's two species there which are hybridizing. Um, that's a very important population to study because again, with it being pristine, you don't get these opportunities very often. So being able to go in there and take that sort of uh, information at this stage gives us a baseline that we can try and maintain for future generations. So how healthy is the Humber? And do you have any projects that are looking at uh, issues to do with the, the quality of the Humber? Well, we're trying to sort of help out on that front and every year we do a beach clean which is in conjunction with the Marine Conservation Society where they collect data on the types of rubbish that um, that's sort of arriving on beaches so they're able to determine how much, uh, whether it's increasing, whether it's decreasing and the source of it as well. So a lot of people think that the Humber must be dirty because the water's brown? 
but this isn't really the case, is it? No, no, the Humber's brown because it's, it's a very turbid environment. Um, there's a lot of water moving in the Humber um, and it's a silty base. And so this, this, this mud basically is just always in the water column. It's always in suspension and moving. Um, and mud's a good thing, isn't it? Mud is a good thing. It can be very productive. Um, it can be very productive for, for all sorts of animals. And actually it has been said that uh, the estuaries can be almost as productive as, as uh, tropical rainforests. Well, it's amazing. Thank you, Katie. No problem. I'm here at Donnanook, one of the four most important grey seal colonies in the British Isles. Grey seals have been breeding here since the early 1970s. They spend most of their time out at sea or on a distant sandbank, but come back to breed in their thousands on this stretch of the Lincolnshire coastline, just south of the mouth of the Humber. Grey seal pups are born with white coats and suckle for two to three weeks. Then the mother leaves them and the pups are driven back to the sea to fend for themselves. Here at Donnanook, thousands of visitors flock here each year to witness this fantastic spectacle. This year, over 1,700 pups have been counted, so it's looking pretty good for the grey seal population. And I believe the latest edition is just behind me, only been born a few hours ago. So let's go and take a look. And here he or she is, at just six hours old, looking a little bit yellow at the moment, but they'll soon wear off. Hello, sweetie. If you'd like to find out more about any of the items on today's show, please go to www.estuary.tv forward slash Our Estuary. Our Estuary, sponsored by the Humber Nature Partnership and BP Chemicals.